Snoozecast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com, and you can also subscribe to us on YouTube at Snoozecast as well. This episode is brought to you by Hot Buttered Toast. Tonight, we'll read another excerpt from The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham, published in 1908. This story centers around four small animals, mole, rat, toad, and badger. Their stories take place in the countryside of Edwardian, England. In this episode, we learn of the downfall and comeback for the exuberant and foolish toad. To listen to this series easily in order, go to snoozecast.com slash series. Get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Irresponsible was walking briskly along the high road, some miles from home. At first, he had taken bypaths and crossed many fields and changed his course several times in case of pursuit, but now he felt by this time safe from recapture by his would be friends, Mole, Rat, and Badger. The sun smiled brightly on him, and all nature joined in a chorus of approval to the song of self-praise that his own heart was singing to him. He almost danced along the road in his satisfaction and conceit. Smart piece of work, that, he remarked to himself, chuckling. Brain against brute force and Brain came out on top, as it's bound to do. Poor old Ratty, my, won't he catch it when the badger gets back? A worthy fellow, Ratty, with many good qualities, but very little intelligence and absolutely no education. I must take him in hand some day and see if I can make something of him. Filled full of conceited thoughts such as these, he strode along, his head in the air, till he reached a little town where the sign of the Red Lion swinging across the road halfway down the main street reminded him that he had not breakfasted that day and that he was exceedingly hungry after his long walk. He marched into the inn, ordered the best luncheon that could be provided at so short a notice, and sat down to eat it in the coffee room. He was about halfway through his meal when an only too familiar sound approaching down the street made him start and fall a-trembling all over. The poop-poop of an automobile engine drew nearer and nearer. The car could be heard to turn into the inn-yard and come to a stop, and Toad had to hold on to the leg of the table to conceal his overmastering emotion of his addictive enthusiasm for four wheels and an engine. Presently, the party entered the coffee room, hungry, talkative, and gay, voluble on their experiences of the morning and the merits of the chariot that had brought them along so well. Toad listened eagerly, all ears, for a long time. At last, he could stand it no longer. He slipped out of the room quietly, 
paid his bill at the bar, and as soon as he got outside, sauntered round quietly to the inn yard. There cannot be any harm, he said to himself, in my only just looking at it. The car stood in the middle of the yard, quite unattended. The stable helps and other hangers-on being all at their dinner. Toad walked slowly round it, inspecting, criticizing, musing deeply. I wonder, he said to himself presently, I wonder if this sort of car starts easily. Next moment, hardly knowing how it came about, he found he had hold of the handle and was turning it. As the familiar sound broke forth, the old passion seized on Toad and completely mastered him, body and soul. As if in a dream, he found somehow himself seated in the driver's seat. As if in a dream, he pulled the lever and swung the car round the yard and out through the archway. And, as if in a dream, all sense of right and wrong, all fear of obvious consequences, seemed temporarily suspended. He increased his pace, and as the car devoured the street and leapt forth on the high road through the open country, he was only conscious that he was Toad once more, Toad at his best and highest, Toad the Terror the traffic queller, the lord of the lone trail, before whom all must give way or be smitten into nothingness and everlasting night. He chanted as he flew, and the car responded with sonorous drone. The miles were eaten up under him as he sped he knew not whither, fulfilling his instincts, living his hour, reckless of what might come to him. To my mind, observed the chairman of the bench of magistrates cheerfully, the only difficulty that presents itself in this otherwise very clear case is how we can possibly make it sufficiently hot for the incorrigible rogue and hardened ruffian whom we see cowering in the dock before us. Let me see. He has been found guilty on the clearest evidence. First, of stealing a valuable motor car. Secondly, of driving to the public danger. And thirdly, of gross impertinence to the rural police. Mr. Clerk, will you tell us, please, what is the very stiffest penalty we can impose for each of these offenses? Without, of course giving the prisoner the benefit of any doubt, because there isn't any. The clerk scratched his nose with his pen. Some people would consider, he observed, that stealing the motor car was the worst offense, and so it is. But cheeking the police undoubtedly carries the severest penalty, and so it ought. So, you had better make it around twenty years and be on the safe side, concluded the clerk. An excellent suggestion, said the chairman, approvingly. Prisoner, pull yourself together and try and stand up straight. 
It's going to be twenty years for you this time. Then the minions of the law fell upon the hapless toad, dragged him from the courthouse, across the hollow-sounding drawbridge, under the frowning archway of the grim old castle, whose ancient towers soared high overhead, past guard rooms, full of grinning soldiery off duty, up time-worn winding stairs, till they reached the door of the grimmest dungeon that lay in the heart of the innermost keep. There at last they paused, where an ancient jailer sat fingering a bunch of mighty keys. Odds bodikins, said the sergeant of police, taking off his helmet and wiping his forehead. Rouse thee, old loon, and take over from us this vile toad, a criminal of deepest guilt and matchless artfulness and resource. Watch and ward him with all thy skill, and mark thee well, greybeard. Should aught untoward befall, thy old head shall answer for this. The jailer nodded grimly, laying his withered hand on the shoulder of the miserable toad. The rusty key creaked in the lock. The great door clanged behind them and Toad was a helpless prisoner in the remotest dungeon of the best-guarded keep of the stoutest castle and all the length and breadth of Merry England. When Toad found himself immured in a dank and noisome dungeon and knew that all the grim darkness of a medieval fortress lay between him and the outer world of sunshine and well-metalled high roads where he had lately been so happy, disporting himself as if he had bought up every road in England. He flung himself at full length on the floor and shed bitter tears and abandoned himself to dark despair. This is the end of everything, he said, who have been imprisoned so justly for stealing so handsome a motor car in such an audacious manner, and for such lurid and imaginative cheek, bestowed upon such a number of fat, red-faced policemen. Here his sobs choked him, stupid animal that I was he said. Oh, wise old badger, he said. Oh, clever, intelligent rat and sensible mole. What sound judgments. What a knowledge of men and matters you possess. Oh, unhappy and forsaken toad. With lamentations such as these, he passed days and nights for several weeks, refusing his meals or intermediate light refreshments, though the grim and ancient jailer, knowing that Toad's pockets were well lined, frequently pointed out that many comforts, and indeed luxuries, could be arranged and be sent at a price from outside. Now, the jailer had a daughter, a pleasant wench and good-hearted, who assisted her father in the lighter duties of his post. She was particularly fond of animals, and, besides her canary, whose cage hung on a nail in the massive wall, of the keep by day, to the great annoyance of prisoners who relished an after-dinner nap, and was shrouded in a cloth on the parlor table at night. 
she kept several piebald mice and a restless revolving squirrel. This kind-hearted girl, pitying the misery of Toad, said to her father one day, Father, I can't bear to see that poor beast so unhappy and getting so thin. You let me have the managing of him. You know how fond of animals I am. I'll make him eat from my hand and sit up and do all sorts of things. Her father replied that she could do what she liked with him. He was tired of Toad and his sulks and his airs and his meanness. So that day she went on her errand of mercy and knocked at the door of Toad's cell. Now cheer up, Toad, she said coaxingly on entering and sit up and dry your eyes and be a sensible animal. And do try and eat a bit of dinner. See, I've brought you some of mine, hot from the oven. It was bubble and squeak between two plates, and its fragrance filled the narrow cell. The penetrating smell of cabbage reached the nose of Toad as he lay prostrate, in his misery on the floor, and gave him the idea for a moment that perhaps life was not such a blank and desperate thing as he had imagined. But still he wailed and kicked with his legs and refused to be comforted. So the wise girl retired for the time, but, of course, a good deal of the smell of hot cabbage remained behind, as it will do, and Toad, between his sobs, sniffed and reflected, and gradually began to think new and inspiring thoughts of chivalry and poetry and deeds still to be done, of broad meadows and cattle browsing in them, raked by sun and wind, of kitchen gardens and straight herb borders, and warm snapdragon beset by bees, and of the comforting clink of dishes set down on the table at Toad Hall, and the scrape of chair legs on the floor as everyone pulled himself close up to his work. The air of the narrow cell took a rosy tinge. He began to think of his friends and how they would surely be able to do something, of lawyers and how they would have enjoyed his case, and what an ass he had been not to get in a few, and lastly, he thought of his own great cleverness and resource, and all that he was capable of if he only gave his great mind to it, and the cure was almost complete. When the girl returned, some hours later, she carried a tray with a cup of fragrant tea steaming on it, and a plate piled up with very hot buttered toast, cut thick, very brown on both sides, with the butter running through the holes in great golden drops, like honey from the honeycomb. The smell of that buttered toast simply talked to Toad, and with no uncertain voice, talked of warm kitchens, of breakfasts on bright frosty mornings, of cozy parlor firesides on winter evenings, when one's ramble was over and slippered feet were propped on the fender, of the purring of contented cats and the twitter of sleepy canaries. Toad sat up on end once more, dried his eyes, 
sipped his tea, and munched his toast, and soon began talking freely about himself and the house he lived in and his doings there and how important he was and what a lot his friends thought of him. The jailer's daughter saw that the topic was doing him as much good as the tea, as indeed it was, and encouraged him to go on. Tell me about Toad Hall, said she. It sounds beautiful. Toad Hall, said the toad proudly, is an eligible, self-contained gentleman's residence, very unique, dating in part from the 14th century, but replete with every modern convenience. Up-to-date sanitation, five minutes from church, post office, and golf links, suitable for... Bless the animal, said the girl, laughing. I don't want to take it. Tell me something real about it. But first, wait till I fetch you some more tea and toast. She tripped away and presently returned with a fresh trayful and toad, pitching into the toast with avidity, his spirits quite restored to their usual level told her about the boathouse and the fish pond and the old walled kitchen garden and about the pigsties and the stables and the pigeon house and the hen house and about the dairy and the wash house and the china cupboards and the linen presses she liked that bit especially, and about the banqueting hall, and the fun they had there when the other animals were gathered round the table, and Toad was at his best, singing songs, telling stories, carrying on generally. Then, she wanted to know about his animal friends and was very interested in all he had to tell her about them and how they lived and what they did to pass their time. Of course, she did not say she was fond of animals as pets because she had the sense to see that Toad would be extremely offended when she said good night, having filled his water jug and shaken up his straw for him, Toad was very much the same sanguine, self satisfied animal that he had been of old. He sang a little song or two of the sort he used to sing at his dinner parties curled himself up in the straw and had an excellent night's rest and the pleasantest of dreams. They had many interesting talks together after that as the dreary days went on and the jailer's daughter grew very sorry for Toad and thought it a great shame that a poor little animal should be locked up in prison for what seemed to her a very trivial offense. Toad, of course, in his vanity, thought that her interest in him proceeded from a growing tenderness, and he could not help half regretting that the social gulf between them was so very wide for she was a comely lass and evidently admired him very much. One morning, the girl was very thoughtful and answered at random and did not seem to Toad to be paying proper attention to his witty sayings 
and sparkling comments. Toad, she said presently, just listen, please. I have an aunt who is a washerwoman. There, there, said Toad, graciously and affably. Never mind, think no more about it. I have several aunts who ought to be washerwomen. Do be quiet a minute, Toad, said the girl. You talk too much. That's your chief fault, and I'm trying to think, and you hurt my head. As I said, I have an aunt who is a washerwoman. She does the washing for all the prisoners in the castle. We try to keep any paying business of that sort in the family. You understand. Now, this is what occurs to me. You're very rich. At least you're always telling me so. And she's very poor. A few pounds wouldn't make any difference to you. And it would mean a lot to her. Now, I think if she were properly approached, squared, I believe is the word you animals use, you could come to some arrangement by which she would let you have her dress and bonnet and so on, and you could escape from the castle as the official washerwoman. You're very alike in many respects, particularly about the figure. Now, Toad, said the girl, take off your coat and waistcoat of yours. Shaking with laughter, she proceeded to hook and eye him into her aunt's cotton print gown, arranged the shawl with a professional fold, and tied the strings of the rusty bonnet under his chin. You're the very image of her, she giggled. Only I'm sure you never looked half so respectable in all your life before. Now, goodbye, Toad, and good luck. Go straight down the way you came up, and if anyone says anything to you, as they probably will, being but men, you can chaff back a bit, of course, but remember, you're a widow woman, quite alone in the world, with a character to lose. With a quaking heart, but as firm a footstep as he could command, Toad set forth cautiously on what seemed to be a most harebrained and hazardous undertaking but he was soon agreeably surprised to find how easy everything was made for him, and a little humbled at the thought that both his popularity and the sex that seemed to inspire it were really in others. The washerwoman's squat figure in its familiar cotton print seemed a passport for every barred door and grim gateway. Even when he hesitated, uncertain as to the right turning to take, he found himself helped out of his difficulty by the warder at the next gate, anxious to be off to his tea, summoning him to come along sharp and not keep him waiting there all night. The chaff and the humorous sallies to which he was subjected, and to which, of course, he had to provide prompt and effective reply, formed, indeed, his chief danger. For Toad was an animal with a strong sense of his own dignity, and the chaff was mostly, he thought, poor and clumsy, and the humor of the sallies entirely lacking. However, he kept his temper, though with great difficulty, suited his retorts to his company and his supposed character. 
and did his best not to overstep the limits of good taste. It seemed hours before he crossed the last courtyard, rejected the pressing invitations from the last guard room, and dodged the outspread arms of the last warder, pleading with simulated passion for just one farewell embrace. But at last, he heard the wicked gate and the great outer door click behind him, felt the fresh air of the outer world upon his brow, and knew that he was free.